I'm delighted uh, to chair this session for a number of reasons. Uh, this, the speakers of this session are great friends and colleagues. Um, and uh, uh, there is also a magical number of speakers. Uh, I'm a great fan and admirer of the Japanese director, Akira Kurosawa, who uh, once produced the masterpiece, uh, one of the movies to, die, to, to see before you die, called The Seven Samurai, which was subsequently uh, produced and remade as an American Western movie called The Magnificent Seven. So today we have seven speakers. Uh, however, uh, because of the gender balance, uh, I would feel uncomfortable to describe them as the seven samurai. But in terms of their scholarly excellence and uh, very significant footprint in terms of policy making, in terms of uh, uh, intellectual contribution as academics, as well as uh, public intellectuals and religious leaders, I wouldn't hesitate to describe them as the magnificent seven. So, uh, but while we have a magnificent seven speakers, we also have a challenge to try to finish on time. Uh, so I would greatly appreciate and encourage our speakers to be very succumbed and uh, open for opportunities to really spell out the key points they want to make uh, and have the situational awareness of uh, the characters from the Magnificent Seven be, and be able to uh, respond to the challenges, including the challenges of timekeeping today. So um, the first uh, contributor to this panel um, is a friend and a colleague, David Burroughs, uh, who has a very uh, remarkable uh, career and a footprint as a politician. And uh, uh, he has engaged for a number of years uh, um, in the field of uh, protection of freedom of religion and belief uh, in his role as a, a special envoy, uh, deputy special envoy uh, to the uh, British Prime Minister. Um, and so we have already recruited him and corrupted him at uh, one of the previous uh, G20 uh, summits. I've seen him uh, 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 being able to really um, pitch very impressive Bollywood moves uh, uh, during religious ceremonies uh, uh, and religious festivities in India. Um, and uh, uh, um, he's very capable of relating to problems and uh, the intersection between religion and sustainable development. And uh, um, in terms of socializing as well as in terms of intellectual discourse. He has always been capable of pushing boundaries in the field. And uh, uh, without further ado, I would invite him to uh, do his presentation. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, yes, looking forward still to dancing to J-pop, but we'll, we'll see whether that opportunity arises later. Thank you so much to Tokai uh, University and the G20 Interfaith Forum for the, for the great opportunity to join you here in Tokyo and take part in this colloquium. Uh, to engage and develop, develop important relationships, which have already taken place actually, both before, during, and indeed after this colloquium. Um, I told my wife that uh, uh, never in your wildest dreams will, will, will I be speaking in Tokyo about religion and culture, sport and peace. Um, Sadly, she replied that I've never actually been in her wildest dreams. So, so there we are. But um, maybe the maybe the idea of religion, culture, sport, and peace uh, being grouped together is a wild idea when it comes to building bridges. But I'm delighted that there's not so such a wild idea when it comes to Tokai University, which uh, it has a Jesuit faith foundation, is full of promoting culture, and uh, especially as I've learnt in the last uh, few days in sport, such as judo, um, in pursuing peace, uh, bringing diverse people from different countries together to heal division and work together for peace. Um, perhaps uh, my own story um, helps to illustrate the relevance of all these uh, subjects. Uh, I'm the UK Prime Minister's Deputy Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. 
my mandate is uh, to bring together faith representatives, organizations, and civil society stakeholders to promote freedom of religion or belief around the world. Uh, and that's a part of what we're doing today. It's not, as we know, about promoting one religion or another, but the essential freedom of individuals to believe or indeed not to believe. It's a freedom to be shared and not owned and certainly not the monopoly of a state or continent, but a freedom which is a universal right and should be cherished throughout the world. As a lawyer, I spent my professional life defending criminals, well, most of them were criminal, um, many of whom I did not like, uh, nor particularly believe in, and certainly did not follow their way of life. However, I knew I had to defend them and be their advocate and do the very best for their interests. Now as an envoy uh, with others throughout the world, there are cu currently 42 members of uh, an International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, IRFBA. Um, Japan is an observer, look forward to them becoming a, a member before too long. Um, I see myself acting like an advocate on behalf of individuals from different faiths or beliefs or non-religious beliefs who are persecuted simply because of what they believe. So we all obviously have a role to play defending this freedom of others as we are here joined uh, together at this colloquium. Academics, uh, students, civil society, religious leaders and governments. I, mean, I, I, I see bringing the uh, IF20 alongside the IRF, the IRFBA helps to build these, um, these bridges and helps to bring participants together. This universal right, this foundational right uh, to a socially cohesive society truly is the, the way forward to a truly prosperous and peaceful society, which is why it matters when we're talking about the G20. It's uh, pertinent that those increasingly authoritarian states have high up on their list to control uh, religion and individuals who want to be free to believe what they want to believe in and not what the state tells them to believe. It is people of faith who are often in the front line fighting for peace. I've been, um, it's a confession, Peter, I've, I've been a politician for what, nearly 30 years, elected in local and national government, and now appointed as an envoy. Maybe you could say that as such a politician, I'm the last person to talk about building bridges. Um, but in my years as a member of parliament, and it's good to be on the panel with a fellow former uh, member of parliament here in Japan, um, in Britain, and now as deputy special envoy, there have been few issues that actually have united more politicians from across the political spectrum and more civil society activists than the right of freedom of religion or belief. You know, what does it do? It takes um, us people's understanding of religion into the, obviously the place of worship. It goes to that manifestation of faith or belief which leads into culture, into shrines, into temples, into mosques, into churches which can be valued. I've seen that being valued already in my visits around in Tokyo and elsewhere by neighbors, by visitors, and not just adherence to a particular religion or belief. But it goes, just, it goes actually beyond worship itself into culture and heritage, which can be both tangible and intangible. Traditions, sharing, for example, songs, uh, dance and sport. We know, don't we, that uh, people's well-being is not just economic. It's about that sense of being connected, hopeful and affirmed. Sharing in, in our culture and heritage uh, helps achieve this, contributes to social cohesion, and can remind us of our common humanity in a way that conferences alone and politicians alone can't. So I, I mean, as we consider sustainable development and the United Nations goal to leave no one behind, people of faith or belief uh, and the freedom underlying it matter and we need to find new ways of language and activities to help policymakers see this. Which brings me um, onto the subject of sport and football as an example. Um, as I conclude this presentation, at the last ministerial conference on freedom of religion or belief, it took place in Prague in the Czech Republic. We were thinking of how can we just get this message about the importance of freedom of religion and belief into the mainstream interest, particularly for a younger generation uh, and we landed up on sport and football in particular. Football is, 
Tennis, and I'm sorry to all those judo fans around, is the most popular sport in the world. Uh, judo is the second. Um, well, 265 million players in the world, estimated 5 billion are, are watching it. Uh, it's got its own heritage. It wasn't a, an English export. Apparently, it came from China, 476 BC, named Kuju. It was ball games in ancient Greece, Mayan Empire, and indeed England as well. A rich uh, cultural heritage. Um, but I ended up getting involved in it, and perhaps if you have a chance um, to just show a photo here. And it was an organization uh, called the Football for Peace organized a match uh, at Sparta Prague, an old communist 250,000 spectator um, stadium, with top uh, Premier League footballers and surprisingly invited me uh, to take part. Um, it made an impact. It wasn't so much, this, here we are, here I am, there I am on the floor. It, uh, it made an impact. There were not so much as my dwindling uh, football skills. I ended up on the floor there um, doing a, what we call in England a, a, a snow angel. Um, but what was an impact was the, 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 the message from um, footballers with different religions and beliefs, how they coped as professional players and how they respected each other. And seeing them come together with myself as this old envoy sent an important message of peace which actually got the main headlines in the czech tv just move on to the next slide football for peace is an example of sports diplomacy its mission to tackle societal and environmental issues um, like sustainable development um, and moving on to the next slide the, the project they have is to rehydrate the earth to help global awareness to activate campaigns for water um, driven by the power of football and soccer that touches, what, five million billion people across the globe. This football-led campaign, then, has the potential to be a real help in helping to challenge and solve the world's climate and water crises, that rehydration projects that they're developing. And it's important, as we move to the next slide, um, to look at how to deploy um, those projects to help the most vulnerable in the community in, and communities globally. That helps our... Uh, the SDG goals, and it's something which both the FIFA and NFL confederation territories are working hard to do to engage together one team to participate in rehydrating their land. And to move to the next slide, it's a great way basically to ignite interest of and involvement of young generation, involve them in the conversation and link into key influences if we just go to that final slide. Um, and you probably won't be able to see all those people and what they've had to say, from, from Pele to uh, those representatives in the UN and other uh, politician decision makers. When we're talking about how can we link in decision makers, one way perhaps is through sport, uh, through football for peace, through judo for peace, uh, with partnerships like with Tokai University, has huge potential to build bridges with religion and culture to benefit humanity and the planet for a more sustainable and peaceful world. Just to the final slide. Thank you. Um, wonderful and uh, delighted that uh, David was able to make the connection with uh, uh, the work of some of my heroes in Turkey, uh, uh, Judo and Solidarity, Judo uh, for Peace, uh, and Judo S, uh, all those organizations which were remarkable for engaging with difficult parts of the world, bringing people together who would not normally get together and eventually find new ways to do things together uh, in the future. Um, and uh, this is an opportune moment to bring into the conversation uh, my dear friend Otto uh, Yoshikawa, who is uh, one of our hosts, but uh, uh, among his talents uh, as a, a, a very uh, senior executive and manager of Tukai. He also works on ethics and economics. And as far as sports is concerned, uh, or rather martial arts are concerned, he's six down in Kendo and a master of tea ceremony. We've had, we spent a lot of uh, uh, long hours uh, um, um, over the table talking about anything from how do you choose uh, your tea vessel for your guests uh, to uh, some intrinsic uh, aspects of uh, as swordsmanship, uh, and uh, he brings, in a way, symbolically, all those different strengths and qualities of Tukai University. Now, to over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice introduction of mine. Uh, 
I'm a kind of the different uh, kind of background for many of us, I think, here. Because I, I was working in the United Nations Development Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And I went to the, I live in the many different countries, so-called LLDC, least less developing country. And like a Zambia, Guyana, Suriname, and like a Bangladesh, and many others. And each country is, when I went to there, of course there's a, a strong religious influence in the world and in the, in the societies. So I try to each country's many countries religious uh, uh, scholars, I studied many different religions. And what the, my basic job was how to develop countries, how to make improving people's life and the food security is how to feed all of them. That was, I was doing that. And so how influence like this social norm and religions. And that's today just, I would like to discuss ethics and economic. And rebuilding the social accountability, this is a title, but I will explain why I put in a social accountabilities. And today, like a sustainable development in capitalism, social con uh, conditions for economic growth, analysis of the economic growth of Japan, and analysis of the economic growth of the United States, and the temptation of the riches, and rebuilding social accountability or ethics in the world, and what we can also the input to the G20s I just uh, would like to mention. And uh, sustainable development in capitalism, I think just I try to put them together, improving a society without uh, emitting harmful materials in order to keeping a, uh, basically uh, environment and keep the world a harmonious society, good governance by international law and norms diplomacy, communication, power balance, etc. But obviously we are not successfully doing it. Uh, but also other thing is also the many thing is maybe Second World War also unfortunately one of the biggest causes uh, economic economy or like uh, each country's uh, like an uh, economic problem. So economic growth without depleting the resources, natural resources, and the human capital. And the those thing is also, the, it is ideally believed that important. And many people nowadays, even the environmentalists, growth is not necessary, try to how to maintain. At, uh, at this moment in uh, our capitalism society, or any society, people working hard and try to making a better life than today. So in order to do so, that if you, it will be resorted, it will grow of the economy. So I think stopping to the growth of the economy, it's not really nonsense. Maybe also the problem is maybe our advanced country, so-called advanced country, I don't believe that, not necessarily, but uh, we have a nice life at this moment, but uh, where I live in, and most people's, maybe they couldn't buy, uh, maybe buy uh, happiness with money. However, at least reducing the unhappiness with money. So we need uh, economic growth. Definitely we need it. So social condition for the economic growth, what do we need? <laughs> And in normally economists, increasing efficiency in the production of the goods and services, maybe using the competitions, technology development, and so on. And increasing in the demand at the same time. This is a very different story. That's the reason supply and demand have to be meet each other. And 
this is my actually this is also the observing uh, Max Weber and uh, uh, French I think uh, philosopher Tacmel repeated economic transactions increasing in demand and supply at the same time this is create economic growth I will just explain a little bit detail more uh, repetitive economic transaction meaning is just uh, I will say easily I'll go to buy a bread and this part of the uh, bread maker bakery they will very reasonable price and excellent bread so next time I'm very satisfied so I'm going again to going back to the same shop okay so uh, if you do this economic will grow so how why, what it is is just only I have five more minutes just I'll talk quickly and this one was also the Jean-Jacques Rousseau was mentioning about like uh, how to catch a big uh, uh, stag and everybody trusting it that's fine but uh, uh, rabbit ran away and he will catch a rabbit so also the stag run away from here so you cannot get it so we need everybody's trust in the society and Hobbes is saying also it's a Leviathan the famous because individual interest is too strong each each people fight and so strong government we need but uh, just so I don't have a time to Adam Smith is not talking about these kind of self-interest but uh, today just I'll pass it and Japan's also the second world after second world war, many people mentioning a different way to the why Japan was developed but I think uh, basically Japan has also the groupness created basically the, from the Edo period and other condition was not really good it's called Goning Miseido it's a, a five men group system and try to they owe the, even the paying a tax all of the family they have to involve it they have to pay for it and also during second world war also the making like a neighborhood group it's tonarigumi they're watching each other try to not to, uh, like a government policy to not to be trained like this but the problem is if you do the groupness cooperation social accountability they can make it but the problem is also easily to destroy. And United States also, if you, this is, a, I just mentioned Taco Bell, and also the Max Weber, uh, when they visited, uh, they made a strong ethics to, they try to, uh, a kind of the, this one was basically Methodist, so the example, try to not cheating each other, try to helping each other and that's the reason they grow but this is not different from the Max Weber's uh, Protestant ethics it's talking about the groupness of the trust each other they don't cheat each other that kind of ethics they keep doing it however and many also the even the uh, Bible and also uh, John Wesley's words basically richness deceitfulness or riches also they cannot keep continue to maintain the ethics because temptation to be a rich and also try to be material everything to level but at this moment so what do we can rebuild to society account or accountability or ethics in the world at this moment as mentioned limitation of the law and ethics in the international market or international society and even the United Nations at, at this moment uh, Security Council whatever it's not working okay so what do we just uh, from the uh, this is a theoretical argument however the, beyond the different sect and religious and we really short time maybe communication network with a, uh, open forum and most probably 
all of them actually try to maintain the key piece is very important also the uh, actually objective of the religions. And those things we should really discuss about it. And long term, through the education, most probably that kind of the international society, we intentionally have to make it. Otherwise, of course, we have to keep going back and keep going back. And everybody said the history repeated, but we try to improving it a long time and through the educations in the world, try to set up such kind of ethics or social accountability for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Kunaoto. And uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, a very important uh, religious leader and dear friend, Audrey Kitagawa. Um, Audrey Kitagawa uh, is of a Japanese ancestry. Uh, she's based in Hawaii. And she's not the only religious leader with ja Japanese ancestry on this panel, but I could almost claim that this is an unfallible statement uh, if I say that uh, she is certainly uh, uh, the, the Japanese religious leader with the most impressive floral arrangement uh, uh, every time she presents. Uh, and I, I, I'm almost certain that this is a, an unfallible statement. Audrey, we uh, are very sorry that you're not here with us uh, in person, but we're delighted that you could join us uh, all the way from Hawaii, and uh, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate your introduction, and perhaps the panelists would like to turn around so you don't have to sprain your neck uh, watching uh, my presentation. So if you could change, uh, turn your chairs around, that might be a good idea. So aloha nui loa everyone from Honolulu, Hawaii, and where I am broadcasting from surrounded by the flowers of Hawaii and wearing a flower garland or lei around my neck. And a lei is a symbol of love and friendship. It is a symbol of aloha. And aloha is a Hawaiian word for welcome, goodbye, and most importantly, love, and is meant to convey the heart of compassion, kindness, and goodwill from the person saying aloha to the person or persons hearing the word. When I began my presentation today, I greeted you with the words aloha nui loa, which means with very much love. Thus, I am greeting you with great love, wearing a lei, the symbol of love and friendship for all of you. In Hawaii, it is traditional that all auspicious events begin with a sacred blessing evoked by a kumu or teacher. And so it is fitting that I begin this presentation with a blessing from a Hawaiian teacher who reminds us of our sacred connection to life with the dawn of each new day that brings the light and shines upon repositories of our knowledge that brings us enlightenment. On this day, may we receive the blessing for today's program from Hawaii, and may all that we share here today help to enlighten our hearts, minds, and spirits to be in remembrance and gratitude to the divine creator of all there is. Can we please play the blessing?
the theme of this colloquium, religion and sustainable development, speaks to the fact that religious and faith-based organizations are being recognized as important participants in discussions about the design and planning of initiatives to improve the lives of people around the world. Religious organizations and communities of faith participate in and support development efforts worldwide. They have been instrumental in helping to implement the sustainable development goals. The topic of this panel, cooperation and sustainable development, is a recognition of the importance of cooperation, collaboration, and communication among the religions and faith traditions and the ability of such engagement to create meaningful social change for people around the world. Interfaith collaboration can foster positive transformation by focusing on the deep interconnectedness of the world's faith traditions, the shared spiritual values of love, compassion, and selfless service can shift the balance from conflict and disaster towards peace, well-being, and a healthy environment for all. I had a wonderful friend, Dr. Hans Peter Dewar, may he rest in peace, who was a nuclear and quantum physicist and former president of the prestigious Max Planck Institute. He spoke throughout the world about the importance of cooperation, cooperation, and cooperation. So I'm pleased to see this word cooperation in our topic for sustainable development. In his seminal writing in the Potsdam Manifesto, he said in the concluding paragraphs called, I am life. The ground on which this new sustainable, organismic, cultural diversity is to grow has been well prepared. For why do political and economic decision makers invoke freedom and democracy when most of them seem to have abandoned this trust in a fundamental commonality? Because they secretly know and feel that deeply anchored in people's hearts is a longing to strengthen their own physical, emotional, and spiritual abilities and to further develop their personalities. And this is possible only in relative freedom. But the great majority of people do not want to use their empowerment against others who are trying to do similar things, but rather to gather with them and motivated by the deeper connection to create a more comprehensive commonality on a higher level. A new but in truth long proven view of human beings is becoming visible, one that assumes a person capable of love and empathy. We should not be misled by the excesses of modern civilization. The human being is capable of much more than being an aggressive, avaricious wolf in the Thomas Hobbes' sense. Freedom to strengthen oneself, not for the sake of victory in struggle against the others, but responsible for strengthening one's own contribution in favor of the whole. Co-liberality is needed to achieve an optimal, vibrant coexistence in the sense implied by Albert Schweitzer's remark, I am life that wants to live amid life that wants to live. All this may sound unachievably utopian, but we should remember the mere fact of our existence as people today should show us that we are successful result of a similar development that has already gone on for billions of years. And we must continue to create new knowledge that allows more vibrancy to flower. We can trust that this power is effective in us for omni-connectedness, which we can call love and which germinates from vitality is inherent in the core of us and of everything else. The many global challenges we are facing reinforce a viewpoint that we need the involvement of religious and faith communities and the spiritual principles to which they adhere to be foundational to the work of sustainable development. In my talk today, I've been asked to address establishing networks and forums of the world religions. And I want to take this opportunity to share about the G20 Interfaith Forum and other interfaith networks that are modeling cooperation among the different religious and faith traditions to address global challenges. And the G20 Interfaith Forum aims to provide religious insights 
into the G20 policy formation processes, working for many years to introduce the humanitarian perspectives of the world's great faiths into the thoughts, deliberations, and decisions of G20 leaders. In her writing of the G20 Interfaith Forum, as Vice President Catherine Marshall said, the G20 Interfaith Forum was launched in 2014 under Australia's G20 presidency. It has progressed from a largely academic gathering time to coincide with the G20 summit to a sustained alliance of diverse religious leaders, practitioners from humanitarian, peace building, and development organizations and scholars. The moral and ethical principles of the world's religions provide the humanitarian guideposts that are important to ensure that developmental efforts are sustainable and will not lead to environmental harm, conflicts, poverty, human rights, violations, or injustice. The goal of interfaith coalitions is not to unite or standardize religions, but to find their deep connections and create global movements for positive transformation. This collaborative and multifaceted perspective is important in these times of unprecedented global challenges. And I also wanted to mention the important work of the United Nations, especially through its environment program and the Faith for Earth initiative that seeks to promote faith leadership, faith-based organization, and communities as custodians of far-reaching value-based perspectives on environmental sustainability. And the other is the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative that seeks to unite all people of faith to end tropical deforestation. It is significant that the importance of faith communities have been recognized by the leading guiding institution of the United Nations and other important fora. Let us celebrate today then as an important interfaith convening itself that exemplifies the cooperative model of engagement that seeks to make this world a better, more peaceful and sustainable place. And I thank you for this privilege and opportunity to be part of this convening from my heart to your heart and from all of our collective hearts to all hearts everywhere around the world. Aloha. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, our next speaker, Yoshinobu Miyake, who is a great friend uh, and uh, uh, has been a collaborator uh, for the G20 Interfaith Forum for a number of years. He sat on our uh, um, executive board uh, and uh, uh, was very instrumental uh, during uh, uh, the events uh, uh, in connection with uh, G20 Japan a few years ago. Um, uh, he's a, a very significant Shinto religious leader and he's also a public intellectual who uh, thinks very seriously about the nexus between religion and development. Uh, Reverend Miyake, over to you. Thank you, thank you. I'm so sorry, my voice is so hoarse. Testing, testing. I'm suffering from asthma. It's very difficult to speak, so less something that's relaxing that I just would like to speak with Osaka dialect in Japanese. First, about this IF20, this framework. It's true for G20, but G7 is just gathering of developed countries and excluding Japan. They have the background of Christianity, but if you look at G20, as you know, Saudi Arabia, such a Muslim country, and China, India, many countries are members of the G20. So in the previous session, somebody mentioned this already. Can you show the first page, please? Different governments have different interests, economic development, environment, building peace, different governments have different agenda. And this year in Brazil, G20 will be held in Brazil and Japan. I just would like to focus on the relations between the two countries. As you can see on the very top page, next page, please. 
It's, it will be held in Brazil, but what do you think of Brazil? It's on the other side of Japan. Japan is a small island country. In principle, homogeneous country, we have this industrial development. Brazil is different. It's a big country. It's a melting pot. A lot of, it's blessed with a lot of nature. I think that's how you understand Brazil. But uh, between Brazil and Japan, there are many commonalities. So about the commonalities, unless you understand that the, the essence of the human civilization cannot be elucidated. Next page, please. Next page, please. Actually, if you look at Japan, among the G20 countries, the, it has the highest forest coverage ratio. It's almost incredible compared with Japan. Amongst the industrialized countries, almost no countries. I mean, Scandinavia countries like Sweden, yes, but the Caribbean islands, Pacific islands, the African jungle, those are the countries that have highest forest coverage. Because in Japan, 68%, two thirds of our land is covered by forest. Brazil, 59%. They have Amazon still. The, Forest coverage ratio, 59%. The right is Brazil, left hand side, that's Japan. You might find it unbelievable, but this is true. Indonesia, a lot of high, but it's on 48% right under the equator. Canada, 39%. US, 37%. Going down China, 23%. Australia, 17%. Argentina, just 10%. That's the forest coverage ratio. But Japan it has a long, long history, as you know. Even if, if you go to Tokyo, you might be wonder where can we find the trees? But look at this. Look at these photos. Kyoto was a capital for more than 1,000 years, for millennia. So the urbanization, no trees in the world. But there are trees, Arashiyama in Kyoto. This is Kiyomizu Shrine, right hand side, surrounded by trees. That means Japan kept planting trees in the history. Next page, please. So Brazil and Japan, there are commonalities. High forest coverage and also animism has been practiced in rather strong manner. And 400, about 450 years ago, as Europe kept expanding, Europeans came to Japan and Brazil. Catholicism, Spain, Portuguese, they dispatched their mission to Japan. So in their perspective, they taught civilization. From our perspective, the barbarians came, killed many indigenous people, both in Japan and in Brazil. Conquestador, they just conquered Inca and other countries. They were annihilated. And people, one hundredth, one thousandth, Ten, one of 10,000 Spanish had weapons and they had guns, they had pathogen, and they expanded Catholicism. At the, almost the same timing, Jesuit arrived in Japan. In the case of Japan, it was in the Civil War warring state period that lasted 100 years. In Tanegashima Island, you can see the gun. The, this came to Japan. But Japanese people did the reverse engineering Next photo, please. And then in just 30 years, in the latter half of the 16th century, Japan became the largest manufacturing country of these guns in the fifth. So in 30 years, the, and then there was a show order, Nobunaga, and they had more guns in the rest of the world. We were defeated in the Second World War, but after just 30 years ago in home appliances, cars, Japan became the biggest producing country after the war. So what were the differences between Brazil and Japan? These are the only differences, actually. So if you look at Japan, the Christian country, the came to Japan 450 years, they tried to spread this. About Christianity, do you know? Hebrew, Greek, I can read them, but I'm a reverend in Shintoism, and here in Japan, fortunately or unfortunately, the number of Christians didn't increase. Still, we see elements of animism. Next photo, please. 
right hand side my brother is doing the purification ceremony here in japan when you buy a new car you do this don't you do this to ask for the purification many japanese people when they buy new cars they do the purification ceremony purify the car car represents the latest technology so when you use something latest technology you do this purification ceremony that's so ancient this, these are robots and that's the fighter jet robot i mean it's this morning a japanese rocket safely landed on the lunar surface that's the number five country fifth country that have done this compared with the us and russia this is more precision in terms of landing but our approach is different in japan if you just go down like this, it's so energy consuming. So it fell down and then it sort of just rolled on the surface, but in a precision location. So the approach is different between Japan and non-Japan. Just like animism, that kind of animistic approach and people's the ingenuity, they work the hand in hand. That's the tradition. So we still do these things. If you go to the rocket launching band, I mean, in the TV it doesn't show because there must be separation between the politics and religion. That's why you don't get to see them, but they do this kind of purification ceremony, even at the rocket launching pad. So social evolution, this is really the, uh, this is different uh, because in Japan was really quick to adopt the evolution in biology, but social evolutionism, has been widely accepted in the West. For instance, in religion, the first, there was so-called primitive animism. And then from there, the polytheism, many different gods, deities, and then dualism between good and evil, like Zoroaster, darkness, and uh, the light, or the devil and angels, and the Abrahamic Judaism, Christianity, Muslim, monotheism so this is in a linear evolution but that this is wrong in my opinion for instance in, in christianity this issue of good and evil still exists if the god is omniscient and omnipresent why do we see problems in the catholic country you have a guardian angel saint something saint something there are many many saint nicholas santa claus and then there are many many gods and then um, guardians uh, that what's that the october 31st that you get that halloween halloween those zombie ghosts uh, and there are many people who actually still believe in them so in a linear social evolution this is not the case in terms of religion and in the case of japan can you see can you see where it is what do you think about 120 years ago here in Tokyo, in a place called Shibuya, during Meiji era in the late 19th century, this is what it looked like in Harajuku and Shibuya, there was nothing. But the Meiji emperor, about 150 years ago, the about them, when we were civilized, he was the emperor, the great emperor. When he died, passed away, people, I mean, he did something so, so much for modernization, but the people wanted to create this shrine. Meiji shrine was established. If someone's alive and he's worshipped, I mean, that's abomination for the monotheism. But Shibuya, there was nothing. But one million trees were donated, they were planted. And then you see the forest after a century. Meiji Shrine, that forest, this artificial forest planted. You can see there are so many skyscrapers. So this represents Japan. On one hand, there is the animism feelings, but at the same time, industries, modernization, high tech, at the same time, they coexist. They can coexist. That's Japan. Next page, please. This is a great Ise shrine. So they go stand, stand by side. Japanese people, you are familiar with this Ise shrine. The, the, the Amaterasu is worshipped, the ancestry deity of the emperor. For every 
Every 20 years, they are recreated, spending eight years, they build new shrines. So 12 years after the new ones built, they start creating the new ones. Right next to the old shrine, they copy that. Everything is copied from the old to the new. And the ancient tools are used, the ancient processes are used, exactly the identical thing is built. So this is very similar to DNA. For several hundred million of years, the creature keeps living because they are changing, but they're not changing. Identical copies are produced in exactly the same way, the great Ise Shrine. You can see that there are actually 125 shrines. They are all copied. When the new one is built, then the divine spirit is transported from the old one to the new one, and then the old shrine is destroyed. And it is repeated every 20 years. So if you look at Japan's approach dynamically, it's conducted at the same time. Let's see. So to do so, yeah, I mean, you need so many trees. So for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years in the future, they keep planting. This forest is for 100 years later. Then this patch of planting is re this is for the next 200 years, 300 years. And this has been repeated. So this is like the life's strategy. Greek, Mesopotamia, if you look at the Zebras, is pyramids of Egypt 4,000 years ago they were built but, but those are ruins how were they built we don't know we have no idea but uh, 2,000 years ago I mean this is Isef shrine is made from wood but we know how it's made why because there are people tools and they were all being copied and they have been repeated now, going back to the Amazon this year in Brazil, I'm so looking forward to participating in the meeting, but there's isolated people who are isolated from the civilization, the indigenous people who live quietly in the jungle. 450 years ago from conquested, although they just fleed from them, but partly because of the pandemic, they if they contact contracted the virus they have to they just die in order to get new biotics jungle the, the, from the soil the people side they harvest the soil bacteria to create a new biotechnology and all western companies including japanese companies are doing those isolated people isolated in people their land has been the stolen often people say that the, the it's a problem that the coal and the others are stolen but in order to it it is really a bad thing to rob them of those soil and others in order to create a new biotics as yoshikawa san said adam smith this is a circular investment for growth you talked about that Ancient the Middle Ages, making profit was a bad thing, but now making profit is a good, good thing. Why? Because when you get something, then you don't put it in the vault, but you invest it, invest it in the circular, and you live in the mythology that the world can become profitable. Why it was a bad thing? what thing or not virtuous thing to make profits in the ancient society because the society doesn't evolve when the buddha uh, and when the jesus was alive that was the greatest period so society doesn't evolve now become uh, the becoming wealthier is it is a wrong thing because that means robbing people of that wealth but in finance you just try to invest something yesterday i sold a so I made a profit. I did that. But those are the numbers only in this finance. The global resources are finite. Once we know that, that's definite. The global resources are not infinite. Those are limited. So making it sustainable, it's so difficult. It's not you can just put sustainable additive on everything we do. What we are doing it's something that is, we feel guilty about. And this is something that I have to remember. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Reverend Miyake. Um, and uh, uh, we are now going to bring into the conversation Michael K. Young, who has been a long-standing collaborator uh, with uh, the G20 Interfaith Summit. He uh, brings both the US as well as Japanese perspective into the conversation. He's a fluent speaker in Japanese, and he has great admiration for uh, Japanese culture. Michael, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Peter, appreciate that introduction. I've, I, I feel like I ought to give my favorite uh, Kurosawa quote from The Seven Samurai, but it's very inappropriate for this audience, so I'm going to refrain from doing that. But I do want to extend thanks particularly to Tokai University. Uh, I think this is an enormously fitting setting in which to discuss these issues, uh, given the focus that this university has had for so many years and the way in which it serves as an example of uh, exactly how ideas can move behavior in ways uh, that really matter in this regard. Um, I want to shift the focus just a little bit from some of the things that we have been talking about, about uh, harmony and how to use religions to create uh, better understanding and address some of these issues uh, to a somewhat less pleasant topic. And that really has to do with the issue of conflicts. Uh, it does occur to me, as I think a great deal about this issue, and as Peter uh, said, I've been involved in it for many years, um, domestic and international conflicts are in a fundamental way uh, among the greatest barriers, uh, not only to stability, but the resource generation necessary for sustainable development or in, indeed development of any kind. Uh, we've certainly seen that over the past 30 years in really significant ways as we have seen a, uh, an increase certainly from the prior 20 years of both internal domestic conflicts and international conflicts and the consequences of those um, Security and sustainable development are intimately related, uh, and in some ways addressing these issues of sustainable development, uh, particularly through the prism of religion, can be very valuable in addressing an issue that the G20 even doesn't itself directly focus on, but is central to much of what we think. Um, we know that, as, as one looks at the studies, I uh, study and teach about conflict, that the underlying cause of a significant percentage of internal and international conflicts can really be traced to scarcity of resources and maldistribution of these resources. Um, that maldistribution and that scarcity often comes from environmental degradation. Um, the same is true for refugee movements, migration movements, and so forth. They are frequently the result of conflict, uh, and that in turn the result often of environmental changes that have increased the scarcity of resources or the distribution of resources in ways that exacerbate these conflicts. Um, so at a fundamental level, if we can think about how we address resource scarcity and distribution, that has an opportunity to move us in a very powerful way to both reducing conflicts, which in turn allows us a platform and a space in which sustainable development is much more likely uh, to occur. The issues are, not surprisingly, they are the issues in which the G20 focuses on economic development, debt relief, education, healthcare, uh, to name uh, just a few. Addressing environmental issues requires attention to many of these exact same issues, but with the attention to address them in environmentally sustainable ways. Um, now, what does this have to do with faith-based organizations and the work we're doing here? Well, the truth of the matter is faith-based organizations can, uh, and when properly mobilized, really play a significant role in helping governments address these issues. We've seen some of this even today, as we talked about resource uh, protection with respect to the rainforest, uh, as we talked about other sorts of issues where there is an attempt to expand um, the way in which the, the religions can help uh, provide the flat platform, provide the space, provide the incentive uh, 
uh, in order to move these important issues in a direction that really does generate sustainable developments. They can do this in part by encouraging the G20 countries to expand significantly their efforts to address these issues. Uh, if one looks throughout the world and understands that um, by some estimates, uh, seven of the eight billion people in the world define religion as one of the central characteristics of their lives. Uh, if that set of resources can be mobilized with respect to their respective governments to address these issues, that is an enormously powerful political force. Um, they can also create a domestic and, a and an international and political environment where addressing these issues is both politically uh, opportune for the governments and in some cases politically irresistible for the governments to do that. Um, governments, I think, also can very importantly partner with these faith-based organizations in appropriate ways to really consider the human, financial, and other resources that governments need to accomplish this. We live in a time of scarce resources. We live in a time where governments, um, because of the programs they generally run, uh, almost all governments find themselves without adequate resources to do everything that really could be usefully done. If you can mobilize the 7 million people, if you can mobilize the resources, the attention, the focus on some of these issues, the capacity to create these partnerships with the government can be simply transformative. Uh, already around the world, in certain parts of the world, you see faith-based organizations providing a tremendous percentage, upwards of 50% of the educational opportunities, even a larger percentage of the healthcare. Uh, in the United States alone, a country considered to be resource rich, um, one out of every seven patients that is in a hospital in the United States is actually in a faith-based hospital, a hospital started by and run by a faith-based organization. If we could mobilize partnerships where the government addresses, identifies these issues, partners with religious and faith-based organizations to address these issues and mobilize their resources, the capacity could be extraordinary. They can model effective, efficient, scalable, and sustainable solutions and approaches to these global concerns that are, so that are so central. Let me conclude with one other thought about conflict and its tremendously destructive power in terms of any of the uh, G7, uh, G20, G7, D20 issues about which we are really concerned today. If one looks at the most credible studies, um, if you look at the underlying or at least a central cause of many domestic and international conflicts, well over half by some of the most credible studies, they have religion as at least one of the major underlying causes, not just resource availability or distribution, not just power grabs by government, but actual um, underlying religious sentiment and conflict in that regard. To help governments find ways to reduce conflict, increase stability and address these issues, faith-based organizations must do a better job of addressing the underlying causes and motivators of conflict within their own organizations and between other organizations uh, as well. I think we saw it today uh, from, uh, uh, from Matthias's presentation, uh, the kinds of things that can be done that can advance that, but that is absolutely essential as well. So it's not only a question of pressing the G20 governments to do things, religions have to, we have to work um, equally hard to help faith-based organizations understand and discover the ways in which they can contribute to this, partner with governments, um, increase the capacity of governments to address these critical issues that generate the conflict, and the religions themselves work um, to reduce the extent to which religious disagreements and sentiments actually have the extent of, a, of, a, of creating and exacerbating and intensifying these very complex. Uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it, it requires moving in both directions uh, and uh, looking both at the governments and what we can do to reach them, but also engaging the faith-based organizations in this cause uh, to address exactly these issues. I see I have two minutes left. I cede my time to the next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mike. Um, um, and uh, uh, the next speaker uh, needs no introduction. Uh, he's called Durham. And there is a very complex triangle between Co, myself, and G20. Um, without me, Co Durham would never end up in a jazz club uh, whenever we have a law and religion conference or religion and sustainable development conference in any part of the world, but he ends up there. So, similarly, without Code Durham, religion and sustainable development would not have perhaps become a field with which we engage every year, um, and the IF20 would not have uh, taken off the ground at all, uh, thanks to Co and his commitment to uh, the mission uh, IF20 uh, has existed for now 10 years, over 10 years, and will continue to inspire people to engage uh, in new ways with questions relating to uh, religion development. Thank, Cole, thank you for uh, making this happen, and thank, thank you for making this event happen uh, today. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I want to begin by thanking Tokai University and especially the Tokai University Research Institute for Environment and Sustainability for hosting this event and making it possible. And many thanks to Peter Petkoff. He takes me not only to jazz clubs, but uh, to all kinds of things that broaden my horizons and deepen my understanding. So I'm very grateful. Uh, thanks also to the various speakers who have come and those who have uh, joined the audience. Uh, the question posed by the sub-theme of this portion of our colloquium points to a kind of empirical information for which there is a deep need. How does religion contribute to the world's sustainable development? Uh, I can tell you that a number of the world's leading experts are grappling with the task of answering this question and the results of their research when finished, will fill volumes. Uh, this coming August, when the G20 Interfaith uh, Forum meets, we will join forces with the Partnership on Re Religion and Development, a major global organization focused on issues of religion and development, to seek answers to this question. Both of our organizations urgently need to be able to de demonstrate the significance of religious contributions to sustainability. It's part of the argument for our existence and continuing work. Uh, now, one would think this would be relatively easy. When one examines the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, two things are readily, readily apparent. First, the SDGs address issues that are among the central concerns that religious communities have had for centuries reducing poverty, eliminating hunger, providing health care, enhancing education, addressing problems of inequality, caring for the environment, encouraging good governance, and many other goals enunciated by the SDGs are among the most central concerns of the world's religious communities. Second, however, and somewhat ironically, the role of a religion in addressing these issues in the context of achieving SDGs is almost totally overlooked. This is in part because the SDGs have been framed primarily by secular policy analysts who tend to ignore religious contributions, but it is also because religious contributions are surprisingly difficult to quantify. The result is an embarrassing lack of attention to the vital role that religious communities play in contributing to achievement of sustainable development goals. Now, one cure for this short fall is simply to start cataloging the immense role that religious communities play in addressing sustainable development goals, in alleviating poverty, reducing hunger, expanding health care, providing education, and so forth. The magnitude of actual contributions is immense, and detailing them is work that uh, some very committed scholars need to undertake. My aim today, however, is not you'll be relieved to know is not to try to solve this problem. It would take way more time than we have, obviously. My aim is to provide, uh, to sketch some types of contributions that undergird the, quality, the quantitative contributions religious communities actually make, 
and, and the barriers that inhibit even greater contributions. So I'm very conscious that uh, this is going to be very partial, but what I'm trying to suggest is some of the type of analysis that, that we ultimately need. I'm going to cite three or four examples, uh, but these are, these are just examples, and we need to think, of the, think more about the types of uh, contributions that religion makes. So uh, my first example is uh, social capital contributions. Religious communities are powerful sources of social capital. By pooling its resources, a religious community can address social needs that isolated individuals could not address. One of the areas that we expect to attract significant attention this year in G20 Interfaith Forum is the growing crisis in the number of refugees and other displaced persons. The numbers of individuals involved is astronomical, now exceeding 110 million persons. Uh, one example of the way that religious communities help generate social capital and indeed material capital is through support for religiously affiliated humanitarian aid organizations. Literally billions of dollars uh, worth of aid is generated and distributed annually through these sources. In addition to financial and other forms of material support, religious communities are often among the most helpful in dis helping displaced persons relocate or ideally return to their own homes. Social capital can take numerous forms, but religious communities are particularly adept at generating the associated social goods that can pr provide massive effective support. So that's one type of contribution. Another has to do with the experiencing the, uh, the experience and networking contributions that religious communities make. Uh, religious communities often have valuable stores of experience dealing with recurring social problems and often provide networks that can be helpful. This is clear in the situations involving disaster relief or in provision of health care. In epidemic or pandemic situations, religious communities are often, often have trained personnel or others less trained who can help address issues that reach crisis dimensions. They are often the most trusted individuals when the, there are questions about whether a specific, of, specific type of uh, treatment should be used, such as immunization. Religious communities are generally better networked at the local level than most other groups and can readily identify needs and help bring needed services to bear, uh, uh, and so on. So that's networking, networking contributions. Uh, another uh, could be called altruism contributions. Religious communities are known for the ability to mobilize altruism. Core religious beliefs often engender altruistic beliefs, beliefs about benevolent attitudes towards others, rendering service to others, identifying needs and finding ways to satisfy them, and so forth. Moreover, there is considerable evidence that altruistic beliefs tend to be more effective in contexts where individual altruism can reinforce the altruistic efforts of individuals in larger group. Uh, there have been studies about the fact that you get, you could have people with the same beliefs, but if they're actually going to church or participating in a group, they will be, it will be much more effective. Uh, uh, People are more prone to act on altruistic ideas if they are motivated to do so by a socially supportive environment and by the example of others. Sometimes altruistic beliefs can take the form of disciplined response. The climate crisis ultimately requires changed patterns of consumption. Altruistic beliefs about stewardship of nature and the environment may lead to more disciplined patterns of consumption. So that's altruistic contributions. Uh, identifying needed reforms. Now, these, these, my types here overlap, and this is not very scientific, but I hope you're getting the idea. The world is witnessing increased patterns of trafficking and subjecting individuals to modern forms of slavery. This can take a variety of forms, including child abuse and online uh, pornography. 
uh, religious communities are often particularly incensed by these evils and are in a position to mobilize reform efforts. Religious communities can play an important role not only in identifying evils, but also in mobilizing social reactions which can help solve problems once they're recognized and in general can help strengthen patterns of good governance. So what I think part of what we need is a more concrete, not, it's not just cataloging all the good that religious communities do, but getting a deeper sense of the types of uh, uh, contributions that religious communities can make because this will help us think more clearly about uh, how those types of contributions can be leveraged. Now, there are, it's also worth addressing issues that inhibit contributions to sustainable development. And here, let me just uh, highlight the significance of freedom of religion or belief. There is substantial evidence that there are high correlations between protection of freedom of religion or belief and achievement of countless other social goods. Sustainable development is among the social goods that are thus optimized. This is not surprising because protection of religious freedom facilitates positive development and expenditures of social capital. A community that does not need to protect itself from discrimination or persecution by the state or by other individuals can devote a greater share of its social capital, its altruisms, its networks, and so forth to support of positive social contributions. Religious freedom protections are not without limits. Uh, but in general, a well-balanced regime of religious liberty serves as an important social filtering mechanism, imposing constraints on antisocial religious activity, but protecting more positive exercise of religion. Freedom of religion or belief helps safeguard those aspects of religion most likely to contribute to sustainable development. Religion, religious beliefs, and religious communities can benefit sustainable development in a variety of ways, and strong protections of freedom of religion or belief helps optimize those other goods. We need to work this out in much, much greater detail, obviously far more than can be done in 10 minutes, but I, I think this is part of the task that lies ahead to, that, that the I of 20 and others need to do to help really understand the, the significance of the role that religion does play and can play as we work together. Thank you. very much Cole um, and this this was a wonderful overview of everything um, we have been doing for a number of years and I look forward to continuing the conversation about uh, the direction which uh, we would take it from here and our final uh, panelist uh, today uh, is uh, uh, Ikisa Fujita-san uh, he is uh, um, a public intellectual, former politician, uh, academic, uh, and he's done a number of uh, uh, things uh, um, in his career which connects with the topic of uh, uh, religion uh, and development. Uh, he's a new friend. We This is the first time we meet and we welcome him uh, within uh, uh, the context uh, of this gathering and within the context of uh, IF20. Uh, Fujita-san, over to you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to be speaking to you. It was about a week ago that Reverend Miyake encouraged me to come. So I'm just making a short speech. Let me introduce my background briefly. I have been working with two international NGOs. One is for humanitarian assistance. Another is for conflict resolution. During this time, I also served in the Japanese national parliament called Riot for 18 years. I'm now back at NGO activities. Our world has developed into crisis with the coronavirus pandemic and now simultaneous conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza. These wars are no longer distant wars but have become my war of tomorrow for everyone on this planet. As a multi-faith conference in 2019, German President 
Frank Walter Steinmeier said, we must be united in our belief that religion must never be cited as a justification for hatred or violence. No war must be waged in the name of religion. There are, however, plentiful examples of religion being exploited to justify war. We in Japan cannot overlook the fact that religion was amongst the reasons why uh, Japan went into World War II. Peace building initiatives by multi religious leaders are more vital than ever. Religious actors can coordinate with policymakers and intergovernmental entities to facilitate reconciliation rather than religion being used to justify conflict. Political leaders, particularly those with authoritarian leanings, are good at agitating religious believers to be against others. Accordingly, Divisions, inequalities, and multipolar disorder can spread worldwide. This is where religious leaders need to make greater efforts to convince their followers to accept and love others, instead of encouraging hatred. In July 2023, last year, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres introduced a new agenda for peace, which outlines multilateral efforts for peace and security. The original agenda for peace was initiated by then UN Secretary General Butros Butros Ghani in 1992, to deal with internal conflicts between different races and religions after the end of the Cold War. Inspired by this concept, in 1996, I initiated an Agenda for Reconciliation program, which continues to provide a safe space for sharing and training in Africa and between Palestinians and Israelis now. As one who has been involved in conflict or resolutions or process in various conflicts. I understand that reconciliation failed when, military, uh, when mediators tried to do it for their own self gain. Religious leaders who are aware of this may have been too modest or reluctant not to show their involvement. But the crisis now we face may require them to play a more visible role. Peace is more of a prerequisite for sustainable development than ever before. A new agenda for reconciliation and peace by religious leaders urged. I am a first comer, but it's a great honor to be with you. I wish you success in this critically important effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fujita-san. Uh, and like uh, the magnificent seven speakers uh, at this panel, uh, the chairman is going to abuse his position and he's not going to be so magnificent and he'll stick to uh, the timekeeping of this panel. So we have a few minutes uh, to, for discussion, uh, but in order to uh, preserve time and give uh, an opportunity for as many uh, of you as possible to ask questions. I would like to group the questions by three at at a time, uh, so so we have uh, enough chance to actually engage a greater number of people into the conversation. So, uh, any questions from from the audience or any comments? Perhaps I could abuse my uh, role again. Um, as a speaker, uh, as, a, as a speaker and now chair, and I just wanted to ask uh, uh, David, uh, Cole, and Mike initially, 
one question. What do you think that uh, IAF 20 has not achieved so far? I mean, there are a lot of things you said uh, about interesting directions, positive directions, but uh, what would you consider to be our m major failures uh, in the pr process? Cool. I, I'm averse to disclosing failures. Uh, one of them is we have not found a better leader th than me, <laughs> and I <laughs> would be grateful to, uh, to solve that problem. Uh, I think we're just beginning to realize the magnitude of the challenges. And, and I think one of the things we need is to build an organization more capable of reaching uh, G20 countries in effective ways and uh, finding more effective ways to com communicate some of the types of things that we can do. We need to be better at uh, mobilizing uh, religious leaders, political leaders, and academics to see ways forward that there can be sufficient consensus that we can really move move things. Mike? Uh, I, I, I think it's important to keep in mind it's a um, young organization in a very complex field because it crosses over not only religions but governments uh, and all of geopolitical affairs um, and so the the fact that it, um, it it still has limitations is not surprising but I think Cole's absolutely right beginning to realize what could be done and what what hasn't yet been quite accomplished I think part of it is to create the kind of intellectual foundation for the case that we're trying to make to the G70 countries, uh, as Cole was articulating. I think we have lots of examples. They're kind of um, uh, anecdotal and episodic, and I think much more systematic thinking through with a much more robust catalog of things that really show how this can be done. I would add to that. Secondly, we need to talk and think through what modalities for actual cooperation look like. Um, I think governments are uh, not accustomed to engaging in many cases with religion, and when they do, it's often detrimental, not positive. Coming up with modalities where governments can collaborate with religion in a way that uh, benefits both the agenda of the government while um, not disadvantaging the religion and not preferencing other religions in the context of that cooperation is really important. And then thirdly, I would say, um, we will know we have succeeded when government officials start to turn us down. That is to say, we'll, we'll, we'll know we're engaged in a real dialogue with them when they actually begin to talk to us uh, and say, no, we disagree with you. Uh, right now, to the extent we engage governments, it tends to be a little bit of a pat on the head and uh, you know, tell us to go and remember our place. I think finding more effective ways to really get to the governments uh, uh, and have a chance to show how they can advance their agenda in significant ways by thinking with us about the issues that we've been talking about here and other places, I think is uh, uh, is important. I think those would be kind of three steps I see moving forward. David, I'm sure that uh, you would probably suggest that one of the major failures are my, were my Bollywood dance moves uh, in Pune uh, during the last G20. Uh, I, I, would, I was trying to be polite and really not uh, but, uh, to get... but But beyond that, uh, uh, I mean, do you feel, you're obviously uh, almost a newcomer to, to this gang, but you know, you've know you obviously fitted in rather nicely. Uh, uh, I mean, sitting on a fence from, from your perspective, uh, do you get a sense that there's certain things which have not been achieved, that could have been achieved? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I try and avoid being a politician and not answer, or answer. But, but um, I think can I just answer it by saying I think there's, um, I've seen um, elements where uh, there's, you know, there's the, there's the, the, the possibilities of what could what could further happen. 
I think one of those possibilities came when we prepared for the uh, ministerial conference on freedom, religion, and belief, and we collaborated and connected in on the issue of cultural heritage. And if it wasn't for that collaboration, which involved the uh, interfaith network as well, uh, cultural heritage wouldn't have actually been included in the agenda hardly in the ministerial conference and wouldn't have had um, a part of a statement which referenced inclusive uh, societies, sustainable development. And so th there's, there's that connection that we made at haste. But I think what we're lacking is to make that further connection in not least to the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance and their gatherings and to make sure that freedom of religion and belief is intertwined with interfaith uh, so that the, the genuine dialogue which is always needed in terms of interfaith dialogue leads to another word of sort of diapraxin where there's actual practice. We don't just, as was mentioned in terms of um, Mateus's uh, uh, presentation about lit true religious literacy comes when we're not just coming together and we don't all agree with each other because plainly freedom religion belief is all based on the fact that we often will fundamentally disagree not least in doctrine but we will come together and fight for each other's rights so the more people that can come together and then ensure that governments get that and understand that better uh, and then they'll see that uh, religion what can be the course of source of conflict can be the source of solutions not least at a G20 level. So there's, there's hints, there's hope, but we need to do a lot more connecting in those different movements and making sure that we see the practice and outworking of it. Wonderful. And now I would like to bring into the conversation uh, our Japanese interlocutor, uh, uh, interlocutors, uh, Professor Naoto Yoshikawa, um, uh, the founder of Takai many years ago, uh, referred to a bit of an embarrassing uh, incident in Paris when the first prime minister after post-World War II, a Japanese prime minister, encountered uh, Charles de Gaulle, and Charles de Gaulle described him as uh, um, a statesman of a nation of excellent transistor makers. And uh, um, uh, in, com in his commentary, uh, Matsumaisen, and say, uh, propose that it's, this is true, that Japan is very good in improving things invented by other people. Uh, but it's also true that we need to find our ways of finding Japanese authentic voices to have an impact and change the world. In this context, however, I'm I was just wondering whether I could uh, challenge that premise and uh, ask you, do you think that as far as religion and policy is concerned, as, as far as religion and development is concerned, there is a scope of revisiting the transistor makers' capabilities of Japan, abilities to improve things which are already there, but we are sort of stuck and cannot uh, uh, really use them the way we expect to use them. There have been conversations about religion and policy for many years. There have, there's been commitment to develop metrics for policymakers to understand how religion should be relevant for politicians and policymakers. But we haven't quite got there. And do you think that Japanese experiences, Japanese ability to actually see Northern Hemisphere politics, uh, the world through through a different lens and usually quite exacting lens may, in a sense, have something to offer in terms of interpreting old themes, which the Northern Hemisphere may have actually lost its uh, uh, nerve in terms of deploying it in new and inventive, innovative, original ways, and and and. Do you, do you think that the transistor-making uh, reference, the transistor-making metaphor may be uh, one of the angles through which Japan could actually make a difference in approaching old legal tools and policy tools in new ways? Uh, oh. I think immediately, it's impossible because the reason was 
I think historical reasons, like uh, maybe before the, like, uh, I would say, Edo period, much more, like, uh, even the accepted Christianity, whatever, but the uh, idea of the under the God, everybody is equal. That kind of the idea was, it's not acceptable in the hierarchical society in the Edo period. So they are kind of try to get rid of the kind of the uh, maybe original that uh, like idea of the Christianities also. And also the, according to the, what is his name? Uh, Edo Jidai no, uh, Edo period's religions, it's a, uh, actually Harvard professor, he wrote about it. That is very, much more religious was naturally also the in the society during the Edo period. However, after the Meiji period, was was established to the religion, it's a kind of the meaning of the special meaning of the sect. And also uh, Shintoism was also the try to be a national religions at, at that time. So except as a religion, even the, like a Buddhism was one time tried to get rid of it in the Japanese government. And however, the, so like a kind of the historically, what is the religion is a kind of at this moment, it's phobia, Japanese people, unfortunately, try to accept looking at the, in generally many different beliefs or whatever. So immediately, I think the Japanese can at the kind of difficult to contribute to the world to using a religious influence to the society or bringing a peace is very difficult. But uh, in the long term, I think Japanese also the uh, education, we have to really create much more accepting to everybody's different belief. That's first we have to start doing. And maybe it is because at this moment we don't have a kind of the so-called national religions and also the kind of it's a kind of flat. And also maybe we went back to originally like a Japanese originally Shintoism also the kind of the Greek methodology. There is a lot of the different God. So meaning is try to starting to many different ideas and whatever to try to we if we can accept like this unless hurting other people hurting a society that's a different and like a, if you bring it to accept how to accept other people's idea and belief that's maybe we can start japan can do and in, inclusively now nowadays inclusively like a, a, a diversities and all of the society we need and in, in order to do so even the diversity we try to accepting a, a societies try to find out the common place not from the different place same as a, a belief and also the interface ideally believe there's many things common starting realize from the common place to understanding each other, that maybe we can start and we can contribute to later. Attracted to that idea partly because it, it also uh, reflects uh, a lot of the strategies which the founder of Tukai Matsumai deployed. He was very good in bringing uncomf uncomfortable conversations on the table by starting a conversation which is comfortable and then creating the momentum to bring the difficult questions and difficult conversations and and, and get people to to endorse them and uh, 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 accept his views uh, fujita san would you like to add something to that thank you so much partly because the way religion was used for japanese militarism at the second world war after the war in a sense the government has discouraged individual Japanese to be associated with any political party or religious affiliation. 
And that has made the Japanese to be passive about the democracy. In a sense, democracy was given by the United States. It's not a democracy that we fought for. Therefore, status quo and also the conformity are the things that the Japanese value. Then Japan was in the peace uh, uh, period for three decades, so to speak, after the crisis period during the war and after the war, when Japan had to be reconciled with Asian neighbors and the United States. And therefore, religion has not had uh, opportunity to deal with novel issues for the last three centuries. I mentioned reconciliation and peace. Reconciliation is usually used for dealing with reconciliations after ceasefire. Peace is to make ceasefire. So we need both reconciliation and peace efforts. We have come back to crisis area since the COVID, the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. So these days, for every Japanese citizen, even in a remote island, those things have become your own problems than before. And this is where the vacuum of beliefs of the Japanese has to be filled. Quite a few medical doctors and business executives, after their retirement, they are finding the vacuum in the spirit and they're suffering from psychological disease and so on and so forth. And this is where Japan has come back to the crisis area that everyone's problems to be solved. And this is where religious organizations have a special role to play, uh, rather than big companies as such. Thank you so much. And find a word by um, Reverend Miyaki. We are uh, running over time, so you have one minute, if you could manage that. <clears throat> So thank you to give the opportunity. So <clears throat> just I would like to mention about the uh, uh, bridge building uh, reconciliation. <clears throat> Last fall in Italy, a new magazine was published uh, titled Yusur, the Arabic word, bridge make building. And the first edition was uh, the King Charles III and uh, the General Secretary of uh, Muslim World League. I, 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 I forgot the wrong name. It, Blah, 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 Aru, yeah, Aru is Aru something. Aru, Aru Islam. So <clears throat> it's a very interesting dialogue. Just I received yesterday for that magazine is uh, like a king of uh, UK and uh, Muslim leaders uh, uh, try to make a uh, change ideas for uh, un to make understand each others. And the second issue will publish recently. And the theme is artificial intelligence and religions. It's also interesting, uh, sorry. And I, I, I already gave a contribution for the idea of the Shinto, a Shintoist to make artificial intelligence and the relationship with religion for everybody. Has, every religion has a different uh, value and uh, like, as a, uh, like a Pokemon, the Japanese anime. But uh, animation is uh, strongly related with animism, so-called animism. That's why the Japanese society, even the uh, high-tech high tech skill and industry and to connect it with, uh, just I mentioned about uh, my story. So uh, at this occasion, uh, we, will we, will make, we will try to make a, uh, as much as possible to uh, change different ideas, point of views, to make one and to discuss each other to, 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 to contribute to the resolve the present difficult uh, issues. So I think this is my point. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Uh, we finish almost on time, and this concludes uh, uh, the, uh, 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 this panel. Um, now, um, Excuse me, Peter. Peter. Audrey. Excuse yeah. me. I'm I'm the only female on this panel, and may I also request that I be given the opportunity to very briefly give a conclusory comment, so okay. that we don't have any, um, you know, ideas that uh, the only woman on the panel has been excluded. So I appreciate this opportunity. So I just want to say very quickly 
that, you know, all of these conversations are really reinforcing and developing the importance of individuals as well as communities, whether they be faith organizations or governments, to develop a moral ethical compass that will help to lead to peace and human flourishing. And, you know, this really takes the opportunity for all of us to be able to practice within ourselves as individuals, our own faith traditions, as well as to understand the ways that we can work together through diverse organizations, whether they be religions or other institutions, to be able to understand that we are looking to be able to sustain life in ways that support the development of our ability to have the greater compassion, love and understanding for each other because it is our relationships ultimately that will determine our ability to be able to have a meaningful and purposeful life. So thank you so much, Peter, for this opportunity to give that conclusory comment. Thank you, Audrey. And I'm delighted that you brought the visible and the invisible uh, within the conversation. Uh, uh, I. Uh, uh, couldn't see you uh, during the uh, final part of your panel. You reappeared and only reminded us uh, how important the relationship between visible and invisible remains in our work. Um, on this note, uh, uh, thank you to uh, all panelists uh, of this session. We will now conclude it. And, okay, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>